Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fifth meeting of the Local Government Communities Committee in 2017. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as meeting papers are provided in digital format, tablets may be used by some members during the meeting. No apologies have been received this morning. We have got a full house and we move to agenda item one, which is decision on taking business in private. The committee is invited to agree to take agenda item six, consideration of its report in relation to EU scrutiny in private. Are we agreed? Okay, thank you. Issues have been raised regarding SSI's 2017-8 and 2017-9 at agenda item 3 on non-domestic rates, and I therefore intend to defer consideration of these instruments to the meeting on the 22nd of February. Are we agreed with that approach? Agreed. Okay, thank you. We now move to agenda item 2. Uh, so, at agenda item 1, one moment, can I just check? This is the danger of conveners reading verbatim what's in their brief here, so I do apologise. So, at agenda item two, the committee will take evidence in the Scottish Government's draft climate change plan, RPP3, and last week's session focused on local government and planning. This week, we will have sessions uh, in housing aspects of the plan, and can I therefore welcome Michael Barton, May Maynard, Policy Manager, Homes for Scotland, Fabrice Levecki, Existing Homes Alliance, David Stewart, Policy Lead, Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, and Liz Marcus, Director, Energy agency. Uh, can I invite each of our witnesses this morning, and thank you for coming along, just not, not so much an opening statement, could you say a little bit about your organisation that, that, that's coming to the committee this morning, it'll be helpful for members, obviously helpful for anyone watching uh, at home. So can we start with Liz, if that's okay? Okay. Um, Liz Marquis, I'm director of the energy agency, but I'm also on the existing Homes Alliance and various other organisations campaigning for um, energy efficiency and carbon reduction. Um, just to explain a bit, the Energy Agency is a charity based in South West Scotland and we deliver the area of A schemes, so we do a lot of work on the actual practical application of um, the funding from the Scottish Government to um, South Ayrshire, East Ayrshire and Dumfries and Galloway councils. And we also have Home Energy Scotland contract, which comes through the Energy Saving Trust and do quite a lot of other education and work across the community. Okay, thank you. Is I understand you were, you were very helpful with some of our committee members on a visit just the other, just the other day as well. So delighted to have anybody to come and see what's happening on the ground um, because there is really a lot and actually it's, it is very interesting to see practically what's happening, I think. Okay, so thank you very much. And we'll, we'll just move across, Mr Stewart. Hi, I'm David Stewart. Um, I'm from the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations and we're the national representative body for housing associations in Scotland. Our members uh, have 11% approximately of Scotland's housing stock uh, and just under half of all the uh, affordable social rented housing in Scotland. Um, we're proud as a sector that we've got the most energy efficient housing by tenure in Scotland, but given that um, typically we, we often house tenants on lower incomes, fuel poverty is still an issue. So while we're very much in support of the, the climate change plan, we've got a great interest in uh, wanting there also to be reductions in, in fuel poverty as part of that plan. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Good morning, I'm Fabrice Levesque. Uh, today I'm here on behalf of the Existing Homes Alliance, uh, which is an alliance of anti-poverty, environmental and housing charities, which campaigns to improve the, the quality of the existing housing stock in Scotland. Um, my day job is a uh, climate and energy policy officer at WWF Scotland and we waited for the climate change plan with bated breath because um, the Scottish Government have told us that the, the energy efficiency programme, the SEEP programme, is a cornerstone of their climate change action in Scotland. Um, so we were very interested to see the, uh, the report and uh, looking forward to discussing it with you all today. Okay, thank you, Mr Levesque. Mr um, Barton Maynard. Good morning. I'm, I'm Michael Barton Maynard. I'm the policy manager from Homes of Scotland, who are the representative body for the home building industry in Scotland. Um, we can represent about 200 different organisations from home builders, RSLs, planning and architecture professions, as well as supply chains. Um, so, who together help deliver around 95% of new homes built for sale, as well as a significant proportion of affordable housing. Um, my sort of kind of day-to-day -day remit is normally sort of, kind of dealing with sort of, kind of technical and skills issues um, for the organisation, um, and obviously this is one of the sort of, kind of areas that we sort of, kind of welcome to um, provide comment 
on recognise the importance of climate change and the kind of impact um, reducing carbon emissions can have on fuel poverty. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. That gives us a flavour of, of, of um, your experience and expertise within the sector. Perhaps we can keep it um, general to begin with and uh, maybe a snapshot of where we are now. So can I ask each of you what progress you think there's been to date in cutting emissions within the residential sector and implementing the proposals and policies set out in the previous RPP2? To what extent have previous RPPPs contrib contributed to the recent drop in emissions from the sector? So we're moving to the third plan. Um, how successful have we been with the previous two plans and how has that provided a focus to, to reduce emissions within the residential sector? So your views on that would be very helpful. Uh, Mr Levesque. Thank you. So looking back to, to RPP2 and the progress since then, I think we do have good uh, fuel poverty and energy efficiency schemes in Scotland. So the Scottish Government, um, in parallel to the Westminster Government schemes, runs uh, programmes like Home Energy Efficiency Programme for Scotland. And those programmes are good, they're a good foundation, but the action we've seen over the last five years isn't at the scale and speed that we need, uh, both to tackle fuel poverty and also, more relevant today, uh, climate change. So if we look at the emissions from the existing housing stock uh, over the last five years, uh, we've seen some reductions. Uh, we've also seen, actually, emissions go up and down, uh, mostly at the whim of the weather. So when we have very cold winters, emissions from housing goes up significantly. And that's actually been a reason for some of the missed um, annual climate change targets in the past. Um, and that's kind of a problem that we haven't designed out the variability in the housing stock. So we have a, still have a very inefficient housing stock, which means when the weather's cold, people turn up their heating and our emissions go up. Um, so I say, the, for me, the, the view is we've made good progress, we've made good foundations, but we need much um, bigger um, activity, a much faster scale of um, retrofit uh, to the existing housing stock. Oh, just for clarity, has the previous RPP2, has it provided a focus? I know you'd like it to go further, Mr Levesque, but has it provided a focus to, to improving standards? It has in that the, it continued um, the funding for the home energy efficiency programmes, the HEAPS programmes in Scotland. So that was a policy in the last RPP. And I think in terms of the new proposals, there hasn't been a, any change. So a, a big failure of the last RPP was the fact that there was a proposal there to extend regula explore regulation of uh, the private, uh, privately owned housing stock. Um, so that's regulations for rented homes and owner occupiers to drive energy efficiency improvement. So in the last RPP, that was listed as a proposal. Four years ago, um, in the four intervening years, we've had uh, a detailed pre-consultation process. The Scottish Government's done a lot of research into how those regulations could be um, introduced. However, that hasn't been done, and once again in this RPP, we have the same proposal to explore the role of regulation in the privately owned housing stock. So there hasn't been any progression since the last RPP, hence why we see the same proposal repeated again. And unfortunately, once again, it's in the proposal rather than the policy category, which means as a proposal, there's no fixed date, there's no firm commitment from government that this will actually happen over the next four years. I'm sure some members want to pick up and develop on, on, on that area as we move forward. So uh, just to remind other witnesses, the question is about the last RPP2, to what extent has it provided a, a focus to, to, to deal with the residential sector and what success has there been? Uh, David Stewart. Um, I, I would say that, echoing through Bruce's comments, um, there have been some significant improvements. There's been the fact that the Scottish Government has... Um, funded home energy efficiency schemes. Um, they've taken an area-based approach. That's been very welcome, and it also helped um, Scotland attract more eco, although that's now, um, sorry, energy company obligation money, although that's more of a challenge um, since effectively the rules were changed on eco and there's, there's less funding available. However, um, I feel um, for social housing that actually regulation of energy efficiency standards has really helped to, to drive investment and that has benefits in terms of quality of life, quality of place, uh, as well as uh, making heating more affordable for people. But that regulation only really covers about a quarter of the homes in Scotland. So you're looking not only at fuel poverty, but obviously at significantly reducing carbon emissions, I would argue that really um, we need to look to be regulating energy efficiency for 
all tenures and, and not just social housing. And that builds on the point we've just heard yes. there. Uh, Liz, do you want to add yeah. anything? Yeah, um, really to, to agree with that, that actually if we can have more regulation, it really helps. At the moment, the area-based schemes and the, the Scottish Government money has made an enormous impact um, because we can actually target all types of housing tenure. Um, so we can do blocks of properties where you've got privately rented, um, private and social housing all in the same block or the same geographical area, which makes a huge difference to the costs. So the, the existing programmes, the area-based ones, um, run with the local authorities or coming through the local authorities and then various managing agents or the local authorities manage them themselves. But that flexibility to target all home ownership categories makes an absolutely massive difference. It's, all, it's about carbon, particularly, and I've got some really impressive figures of, and real figures of what's been happening um, in the existing programmes. But it's also about if you invest, say, 6,000 in a property, um, some of those properties that we've been working on, the steel-framed ones, um, they are actually not in a fit state for living in at the moment, and they are... Um, likely to fall to pieces quite quickly. So if you invest that amount of public money in that property, you're actually providing a long-term investment for that home, 36 years um, for the products and 25-year guarantee. So you've, it, it has a lot of other benefits in terms of health um, and social benefits, but we we'll can come on to them, but um, very strong economic benefits as well for the, social, for the local areas. I'm sure we'll come on to it. That's yeah. very, very helpful. Uh, Mr Barton Maynard, do you want to add? Um, from the sort of new build sector, it's probably saying, we're saying there's quite a lot of positives, um, probably driven from the um, RPP2 um, in terms of the eight step changes in standards that's going to come through. So, you know, today's standards, 2015 building regulations represents a 75% reduction in emissions from 1990 levels, which is quite significant over the, you know, a, a change over essentially the past 10 years. Um, you know, what we've seen from the data sets that we've collected um, is average EPC racings of a B, um, bills, kind of, um, well, estimated energy bills for space heating, lighting, um, it's just going to drop to around £50 to £30 pounds per month um, in comparison to the Scottish average, um, which is around £108. Pounds. Um, and also, a lot of home builders sort of kind of readily adopt um, loan zero carbon energy generating technologies, um, such as photovoltaics and um, air source heat pumps. So, in terms of what the new build sector are doing, I think there's been quite a lot of positives that have going to come out from the, the last RPMP2. Um, in terms of RPP3, this seems to be the same proposals on the table, further um, sort of kind of further evaluation of regulation, um, increasing of energy standards. Um, and I suppose looking at um, elements such as district heating, um, I suppose it's a probably a good place to be in that we're talking about some of the challenges that these proposals may um, have on the industry. So, um, you know, our members have always sort of, kind of um, noted that we've sort of, kind of come up to a point in time with building standards where we're reaching cost optimal levels um, for improvement, where there'll be I suppose very little um, return on the additional investment to a sort of new build property in terms of energy efficiency. Um, also, that the national infrastructure um, is not really designed for um, delivering low and zero carbon energy generating technologies um, within. So we, we know that we've had experiences of having difficulties connecting PV back up to the grid. Um, and also sort of, kind of inconsistent approaches across the implementation um, of um, the sort of Climate Change Act through the, um, through the planning system. So in terms of, sort of, kind of new build, a lot of challenges, a lot of positives um, there. But um, probably in agreement with um, a certain colleagues um, since to my left, that the scale of the new build sector is only 0.63%. It's very small. Um, the focus should probably um, primarily be on existing stock. That's where um, we sort of feel that the main sort of goal could be in terms of carbon reduction. Okay, that's very helpful. That there's a there's a common theme from from all the responses, which seems to be there's a strong evidence base that good progress has been made, but the real challenge is existing stock. And, and I think Mr. Levesque was making the point that uh, in terms of within RPP3, it seems more of the same 
in relation to aspirations over the standards and existing stock rather than any statutory improving of of standards, if I've captured the flavour of, of what people are saying. Before we move to other MSPs, can I just check? So that's an example of perhaps what witnesses feel we're not so much building upon RPP2, but duplicating something within RPP2. Is there evidence within the, the, the new proposals that UC is actually developing uh, on, on existing practice, building upon it and giving added value rather than the same again? Anyone want to comment on that? Yeah, Mr. Levick. Yeah, I'll come in. Uh, so, yeah, I think we should recognise that there are some good things in terms of the um, energy efficiency policy that's being redeveloped. So, um, about a year and a half ago, the Scottish Government designated retrofit energy efficiency as a national infrastructure priority. That was following a missed climate change target in recognition of the greater effort that's needed in the sector. So, that policy has been in development and it signals from 2018 that we will have an expanded, uh, more comprehensive energy efficiency programme across Scotland. So building on the, the schemes that Liz involved in at the moment. So we should recognise that there is a policy development process ongoing. Um, unfortunately, it's very difficult to see that within the climate change plan itself. Um, so I think actually, if we were to go back to the Scottish Government and ask for more detail, there is some there. So there's a, in parallel within the energy strategy, there's a consultation on um, Scotland's energy efficiency programme, SEEP, and that contains a little more detail in terms of talking about the role of regulation, incentives, and how the, uh, the programme could be developed. Unfortunately, that, none of that information is in the climate change plan. So what we have in this document is uh, the same very uh, loosely worded commitment to exploring the role of, of policies. So there has been some change, but it needs to be reflected within uh, the plan itself. That's quite helpful. Does anyone else want to add anything to that? I don't see anyone uh, taking uh, up the cudgels in that, so we'll move to Ruth McGuire for the next question. Thanks, Convener. Good morning, um, panel. Um, I'd like to hear your views on um, policy outcome one, which is the um, imp about the improvement in um, the fabric of domestic buildings, and that 6% um, reduction in heat demand by 2032. I'd like to hear whether um, you feel that target is realistic and whether the range of policies and, and policy proposals detailed in the plan will help achieve that. Okay. Um, Mr Stewart, you have made, unfortunately, made eye contact, so we'll take you first, yes. Uh, um, yeah, I, I would say that um, it, it is realistic and that the proposals should allow it to, to be achieved. Um, I, if I'm not going beyond the question, so I would... would suggest given levels of fuel poverty and given the potential of home energy efficiency to deliver reduced carbon emissions, I, I would prefer that that target was higher and there was perhaps more emphasis on this approach rather than, for example, on, on the use of new technologies or, or other approaches to deliver uh, the target reductions. Um, I'm just wondering whether to bring the EPC issue in at the moment, or it's maybe a little early, but um, the existing Homes Alliance is very much pushing for um, most houses to be at EPC level C by 2025. Now, there is very clear evidence that um, the higher up you, you go, a, an A or B or C rating is, the, is better than... Um, the E, F and G ratings, just to explain. So, but it's very clear that when you look at the fuel poverty um, angle, um, the number, the percentages of people in, who are on low incomes, which obviously has a major impact on your poverty level and your fuel poverty, but um, if you live in a more energy efficient home with an EPC rating of B to C, 66% are in fuel poverty. However, the instance of fuel poverty among the income poor rises to 99% among those in the least energy, efficiency pro energy efficient properties with an EPC rating from E to G. Now, it's, that's one of the, if you can, in, I think it is possible to increase the homes um, to much higher levels of energy efficiency through the external wall programs or internal wall programs and actually making the existing homes more efficient. Um, 
by the, the measures that we currently are able to do. Um, and I would definitely encourage that, that route. It is expensive, but when you take all the other benefits into account, um, which is difficult when it comes out of an energy efficiency budget, but actually it, it allows, lowers um, the rates of people going to their GPs, um, and there's a lot of other economic benefits to the local areas. So it's difficult when it just comes out of an energy efficiency budget, and at least politically everybody seems to be bought into the fact that energy efficiency is a really good thing, and we want to be improving people's lives through that route. So, Any other witnesses want to come in, Mr Levesque? If I may. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So the existing Homes Alliance has been calling for a long time um, for the Scottish Government to set a target for its energy efficiency programme to bringing all homes up to EPCC by 2025. Um, so the, the ambition that's in the policy outcome, the first policy outcome, is uh, around about that level, but by 2032, so significantly later. Um, and in our view, uh, fuel poverty is a reason to go faster on energy efficiency, not slower. Um, so as well as delivering the cl climate benefit, we should be being ambitious on efficiency to, to get that double win. Uh, in terms of uh, policy outcome one, I'd like to draw your attention also to the credibility of that outcome. So whilst it sets out a useful vision for where emissions will be by 2032, reductions from efficiency, you can question how credible it is that we actually have the policies and the resources to get there. So for example, uh, there's a table in here which um, illustrates that policy outcome over time. So it gives us an indication of kind of what's the, what's the stepping up. And it envisages a doubling of activity in 2018. So we go from about 45,000 insulation measures installed a year to 90,000. Uh, yet in the plan, there's no policy to achieve that. So it's very unclear to us looking at this, given that we know that Scottish Government funding for energy efficiency is fixed to 2021. Uh, there'll be no new regulation coming in. Um, how exactly the rate of insulation doubles um, from one year to the next, and in, in the next few years. So there's a credibility gap in terms of the near term, and obviously looking to, to the 2032 outcome, um, once again, if you add up the sum of all the measures that will probably be funded with the policies we have, it's maybe about 200,000 homes, whereas that 2032 target implies upwards of a million homes improved. So we have a huge policy gap in getting from 200,000 homes to the excess of a million that we need to improve. Mr. Barton Maynard, do you want to add anything? Um, there's probably, in terms of new build, there's probably not many further comments on that. I mean, I think, you know, as we agree, the focus is on the existing stock. I think that's where um, the sort of main benefits can sort of be reaped in, in terms of um, carbon, carbon efficiency. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, thanks for those answers. Two of the policies listed as, as helping towards that outcome, the um, smart meters and the energy company obligation, um, the responsibility for those lies with the UK government. Um, so I'd, I'd be interested to hear um, your reflections on how effectively the two governments are um, working together on this agenda. It does happen sometimes. It does. You know? Yes. <laughs> Anyone want to comment on that? Briefly say that. Thank you for getting us out of hole there. Thank you. <laughs> Just very briefly to say that it, it is um, incredibly complicated. Um, and our um, colleagues down south, who uh, we have worked with a lot over the years, um, they can't believe how lucky we are in Scotland and how much is happening in Scotland. And we've just had um, uh, Jenny Saunders, who's Chief Executive of National Energy Action, um, in, based in Newcastle. And she's just been looking around the same site that we took uh, members to on Monday, um, just to see what's happening in Scotland, because they are so envious of the work that's going on. Um, and that's through the additional funding. It's not quite answers your question, but um, yeah, it's, it's a very positive picture up here compared with what's happening. We like to hear good things as well. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> Mr. Stewart, do you want to add? Um, on smart meters, um, I actually think they've got a great potential to help um, with both energy efficiency and, and fuel poverty. Um, a group of our members um, or of housing associations have set up a not-for-profit energy company called Our Power, which aims to provide energy at a fair price, but also crucially to get away from what's sometimes called the poverty premium, where people pay more 
if they're on low incomes and they're uh, paying by prepayment methods. And the way they really manage to do that is by rolling out smart meters as quickly as possible. And that, um, that basically allows them to charge the same tariff for people on prepayment. As far as the energy company obligation goes, um, I think in principle there's great potential there for it allow, to allow schemes designed in Scotland to really meet Scotland's needs uh, and, for example, concentrate more on measures that are a challenge here, such as uh, off-gas areas or solid wall insulation. What I think is less clear today is when Scotland receives the extra devolution uh, of this energy funding, just how much control comes to Scotland and to what extent it has to follow the UK scheme. So I, I would say that's almost something that we still need to see how it develops, but, but there is po potential for it to help. Any additional comments on that? Yeah, Mr. Um, yeah, I'd say echoing Liz's comments, Scotland's taken a lead in terms of it has probably the leading um, energy efficiency schemes across the UK, which is starting to be applauded. And you're also seeing a lot of energy, energy efficiency companies, supply chain contractors, manufacturers of insulation and build, building materials looking at what's happening in Scotland because we have a longer term framework and there's a commitment there to actually do this work. So I think Scotland's starting to see the benefits and could get more. Uh, in terms of the relationship with the Westminster government, um, absolutely the policy there has been going in, in reverse over the last few years. That said, there are some areas where Scotland could learn. For example, there are regulations coming into force in England and Wales um, from 2018 uh, which would enforce minimum energy efficiency standards in the rented sector. So th they're already getting on and doing this. And this is an area where actually Scotland's behind the curve because at the moment we just have a proposal to at some point uh, explore this. And it's been a proposal that's been discussed for, as I said, more than five years. OK, uh, Ruth, do you want to follow up on some of that? Thank you. Uh, a couple of supplementaries in, in relation to this theme. I'll take Graham Simpson first. Yeah, thanks. Um... So I've got a general question, then I want to uh, ask you about EPCs, which uh, you mentioned, Liz. Um, first of all, I'd just like to thank you, Liz, for the uh, hosting uh, myself and Andy Whiteman on the, the, the visit this week. It was uh, very informative. Um, and it was great to see the good work that's going on down, down in Ayrshire. So thanks very much. Um, my, my general question it kind of touches on something that Fabrice uh, Levesque said. Um, and it's around policy. So the Scottish Government expects that emissions for the residential sector will fall by 76% by 2032. Um, not, not that far away, really. Um, do you see any evidence that they know how to achieve this? Fabrice. So on the... Um, so if you look at the, the trajectory for emissions from buildings, yes, it's very ambitious, particularly beyond 2025. And that's in particular because uh, the Scottish Government's climate change plan anticipates a very rapid um, switch over from of heating systems, particularly gas boilers, to, to alternatives. Um, I think it's unfortunate they didn't unpack the trajectory that's going on within that um, heat policy, because if we look at kind of the stages of what we'd like to see, um, in the near term we should be doing um, heat pumps and off-gas grid properties, um, switching people off um, oil, boilers to something cleaner and pushing heat networks in town centres and on heat networks the Scottish Government does have a consultation on looking at regulation for to support the growth of heat networks so it's a shame to not see any ambition in terms of what that um, stream of policy work will deliver um, in the climate change plan. Um, looking uh, to 2025 and beyond absolutely we have we have concerns over that um, the credibility of that pathway, mainly because it rests on UK government decisions. So um, the plan acknowledges that it's probably uh, work on the on homes and buildings that are on the gas grid that delivers that carbon saving, yet it essentially says we will do nothing until the next RPP, at which point we'll then begin to think about a solution for this. And also says but we're waiting for the UK government to give us clarity. Um, and as we've seen with, say, the regulations that I've referred to, um, if it's, in a, if it's a proposal in an RPP, it might be four, eight years to actually become uh, a tangible policy. So the fact that this renewable heat 
This intangible renewable heat policy delivers a huge abatement from 2025, yet no work starts on that is a big problem. And the last point on, on the heat side of things is the trajectory in, in the climate change plan sees uh, a rapid increase to 2020. Uh, once again, there's no change in policy there to deliver it. So uh, existing policies suddenly start delivering twice as much in the housing sector as they, have, as, they, as they do currently. So that's puzzling. And then we have a flatlining from 2020 to 2025. Um, so if you're an industry that's installing heat pumps, wanting to do heat networks, the fact that the government anticipates no progress and no policy for five years, and then an incredible rapid rollout in seven, just isn't really credible. We would much rather see a gradual uh, decrease over time, which would give supply chains an opportunity to, to expand, and also mean that we actually tackle the, the heat sector in the stages that we should be. So the off-gas grid, urban heat, and then thinking about the gas network. Title is yes. From a practical point of view, I'd really like to point out that um, heat pumps are amazing things, but you need to only install them in properly insulated properties. That if you, they give off low level heat. So if you install a heat pump in a drafty cold farmhouse, it will still be a drafty cold farmhouse and cost you a fortune because it, it produces a low level of heat. So it's brilliant in new build or properties where there have been really good external or internal wall insulation. But that, that's the other side of working on off-gas areas, that it's really important that you put the correct technologies in. And what we don't want is something like the previous photovoltaic boom where people moved from um, quick sales to selling um, photovoltaic panels and putting them on north-facing roofs and offering people a loan. That whole um, scenario is a complete nightmare for everybody and it discredits energy and, and everything that goes with it. So I'm very keen that there should be a long-term plan and it is very clear for the industry and for people working in, in it, as well as the commercial sector, um, what's happening next. But, but I just have a real concern about heat pumps and would just like you all to understand the the heat pump issue um they are great when they're installed in the right place yeah. okay thank you mr short did you want to add yeah just just to add briefly to what fabrice and liz have said um the the switch the transition to low carbon heating technologies is rapid and ambitious and maybe to build on what i said earlier um feel strongly that you don't want to be doing that without having first um, really invested in home energy efficiency. I, I would also agree that, you know, initial um, introduction of low carbon technology should be an off the gas area. There's been a couple of housing associations have benefited hugely from installing heat pumps in rural areas. And in that way, you're providing more affordable warmth. However, if you're looking at um, renewable heating in areas that are currently on the gas network. If you don't sufficiently insulate homes, you could actually have the unintended consequence of increasing fuel poverty. Yeah, thank you. Now, I'm not, not taking it, Mr Barton Maynard. I'm just checking you're not seeking to come in on this, on this point. Anything I don't need to. No, um, that's fine. OK, just make sure you catch my eye. I don't, I don't want to exclude you from the conversation if you want to come in and respond to it. Graham Simpson, do you want to follow up now before I take Mr White in for a supplementary <coughs> as well? Um, if it's OK, I'd just like to explore uh, EPC, which was mentioned yeah. earlier. Um, um, I've heard from various, various people now that uh, there are issues with um, EPC ratings and their accuracy. Uh, would anyone like to comment on that? You know, in, in other words, if I can give you an example, um, two people could um, do an EPC uh, check on a property and come up with different ratings. Oh, right. From, from, for our witnesses all looking at each other rather than looking at me to answer the question, I've got two bids. Oh, 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 oh. oh. Fabrice Levesque, apparently you. you are starting <laughs> and you are welcome. Um, so, yeah, on the, on the EPC um, issue. Uh, we're well aware that there are um, quality issues in terms of the assessments and some underlying issues around exactly how the, the assessment reflects certain measures. 
Uh, that said, I think it shouldn't be used to hold up development of the SEEP programme. And the Scottish Government is working with the UK Government at the moment to iron out some of those issues. I think the EPC, th th those certificates play a useful role in that, just like sort of um, energy labels on white appliances, they're an easy to understand, w widely understood concept of a ha this house has X rating for energy efficiency. Um, so I think that's a really useful tool. It's well understood by the public. And part of the challenge of expanding um, our installation schemes is to engage the public and get people to understand the benefits. So I think in terms of the link between the EPCs and the regulations and the targets, I think in the near term we're saying essentially let's try and improve the worst houses, so the F and G rated homes, the really absolute terribly insulated single, single pane windows, roof is leaking heat out to, to, to the wider world. And for those homes, an EPC assessment is simply identifying, yes, you don't have loft insulation, you have um, a leaky door, and you don't even have a, a filled cavity. So I think an EPC assessment for those kind of interventions is absolutely um, right. We don't need to over-engineer the problem and design a, a very complex uh, assessment scheme just to identify those. In the longer term, as we move up the, the, the bands towards uh, D, C, B, uh, there, granted, the, the interventions become higher cost and the quality becomes a, a bigger issue. But I think the Scottish Government, in their work plan for the SEEK programme, do have a stream looking exactly at this. And I think we need to make sure that, in the near term, we're happy using EPCs, and in the longer term, we improve them so they deliver on those more, uh, more expensive measures. Mr Simpson would want to remind you it was about the consistency and accuracy of some of the certification in the properties. I, I don't know, Liz, if you could help us a little bit more with, with that. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with what Fabrice has said. Um, EPCs are a tool, and they uh, historically, um, we have found there's been problems, just as um, has been mentioned, that they haven't always been carried out as effectively as they should have been. Um, but currently with the area-based schemes, we're picking that up because in some cases it looked like um, the EPC had gone down um, because somebody different had done the, the pre- and the post-EPC. Um, so probably when we've been doing area-based schemes, we've picked that up more than you would normally know. Um, in that case, we've asked people to go back and you can usually tell where the problem is. Um, and... There's a huge amount of information that is fed into the EPC and it makes, in a lot of cases, you can tick a box that says unknown and it defaults. Um, and that's part of the problem. So it's partly the policing of the EPCs, which wasn't maybe happening as much as it should have been because EPCs have been used for other things. Um, but generally, and interestingly, we've got an example where um, the modelled um, EPC on a gas central heating house, which is a two-storey end terrace, small one, um, council tax probably um, B, um, and there's actually 2.3 people in the property, but actually the EPC, sorry, the EPC will assume there's 2.3 people in the property and there's two adults and three children. Um, so the modelled savings as a result of um, external wall insulation is 141 um, but actually, they've achieved £732 savings, real savings, um, because they don't quite fit the, um, the modelled um, 2.3 people in the household. So there are problems with it, but actually it's better than anything else we've got. So I would strongly suggest that we, we stick with it and go with the UK government trying to improve it at the moment and, and work on it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr Simpson, just because of time constraints, I was intending to move on and I will take you back in, 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 la in later. Um, Mr Whiteman, you did have a supplementary on this area, but I, I note you want to ask about policy outcome too, and I'm keen to get on to that as well. Um, can I ask you maybe to, to not come in at this point, and I'll take Alexander Stewart to come in and cover some more of the ground in, under policy area one, which might be helpful. Uh, Alexander Stewart. Thank, thank you, Kevinia. Good morning. Uh, You've touched on the scope for improvement of energy standards uh, within building regulations and how that will contribute uh, to greenhouse gas emissions. I'd like some expansion on that. Uh, and secondly, given that the review of energy standards within building regulations has yet to start uh, uh, and the timescale for 58,000 measures by 
2018. How realistic are we about that in the process? So that's the two areas. Thank you, convener. OK, thank you, Mr Stewart. Uh, your namesake, Mr Stewart, has made eye contact with me, which is always a good thing. Do you want to come in first there? Uh, can I just clarify, you, when you're talking about building regulations, you're really talking about new build housing, is that well, right? I mean, because, yes, that, that has a bigger impact in the, in the new building mm -hmm. that, we're, that we're dealing with. But there also has impacts in, in others that may require to have things added in addition, uh, uh, extensions and other things that happen too. Um, I would say there, there is scope and potential for um, building standards to essentially, uh, for new build homes, look for zero carbon homes. Um, and I think it would be good to get clarity on that and when that would happen so that developers, housing associations, councils can then, and, and in fact builders in the supply chain can plan for that and work towards it. Um, it's an important area, however, it, I, I would tend to say that the focus should probably be, be on existing homes as they've got the, the greatest potential to deliver carbon savings uh, and, and also new homes, even if they're not quite at the standards we would like them to be at yet, they're still relatively energy efficient and, and Michael quoted figures on, on energy bills for the average new build homes, which are obviously a lot a lot lower than you might have, for example, or if you were in an off-gas area and you were rated a, a, as an EPCF. So, I mean, my view would be it, it's got a place, but the focus should, should be on improving existing homes. And we'll maybe discuss existing homes uh, more, but it's, I think given, given that uh, Mr Barton Maynard's here and, and new homes has been suggested and we know there's a differential in standards between the social rented sector and uh, private for sale homes, what are the opportunities within the sector that you represent, Mr Barton Maynard? Um, in terms of building standards, um, I think we would always suggest that it's, it's good to have a long-term sort of plan and vision about where we're wanting the standards to go. Um, I think currently through the Sullivan report, we have had that um, in place, um, yet the timescales and I suppose given the fact that over the past 10 years, the market has been quite volatile, there's been uncertainties, it'd be good to sort of reaffirm what the direction is so industry understands where, where it can go in the future allowing supply chains and technology to catch up with the sort of standards. You know, as we agree um, with some colleagues that, you know, the standards have presented quite a, a bit of a challenge in 2015 um, for um, home builders to sort of meet, but um, the solutions are coming forward now. Um, probably worth sort of, um, pointing out that there has been, in many respects, a sort of three-year cycle of um, sort of step changes in the energy standards, which doesn't really provide enough time for I suppose industry supply chains to sort of come up with the solutions that um, that will help sort of meet them. So probably you know the opportunity there is to sort of provide a sort of longer sort of leeway in and uh, I suppose engage with sort of industry suppliers and developing building standards to make sure that the solutions that are coming forward are mainstream solutions and also give that vision and confidence to the market. Pick up on any of that? I know there's a number of very specific questions you're hoping to, to ask. Uh, I, I'm content, can we, you know, with, with the response we've had there, but, but I think that if I can move on to the second one about where the Scottish Government fits in in this process, uh, and I think that, you know, there's a need, and what's your view about the Scottish Government's need to influence consumer behaviour in terms of the additional energy conservation that can be, and how it's measured, and is there sufficiently addressed by the CCP? Do you believe that, that, that we have that right and what the government should be doing to try and manage that as we go forward? So how, how do we influence consumer behaviour? Um, yes, Mr Levick. So I think there's a three, three prong approach to doing this. Um, so you provide information, which we kind of do with the EPCs already. If you rent a house, if you sell a house, it has to have an energy performance certificate with it. Um, and the Energy Saving Trust in Scotland do a lot of good work to kind of um, educate people and advertise the benefits. Um, the second part is to provide incentives, so um, encourage people to do the things that we'd like them to do. And then the third part is, is, the, is the regulation, is the stick. Um, and I think at the moment we're kind of doing the first two, um, but we're lagging behind on the, on the regulation part. And I, I welcome your, your previous question as well, because 
Um, very simply, as it's currently worded within the Climate Change Plan, we don't know if we're talking about regulation of new buildings or existing homes. Um, and the fact that there is more detail in a separate consultation, uh, surely that should be in, in the Climate Change Plan. Okay, any witnesses want to, to add, add to that? Uh, Liz? Um, just thinking from the, from the Home Energy Scotland delivery side, it is really interesting when you talk to people, they phone up about their energy bill and you say, is it high? And they say, well, it's about the same as my next door neighbours. I think it's fine. Um, and, you know, we, we only, our, our views of what's okay for an energy bill, it may be two or three thousand they're paying a year, but if all the houses in the street are badly insulated, that seems to be the, what, the figure that's, that's fine. And it's, it's really interesting. We have to be so careful how we ask people the question about do you feel you're paying too much for your energy bill? Because actually none of us really know um, unless we're in the industry. And even then it's interesting. People aren't quite sure. So it, I think it's, it's helping people to understand that. And we do a lot of work in schools around exactly that and how to use energy and waste and water um, correctly. But it's, it's more people hear it from their neighbours and their friends and from Scottish Government and politicians as to what, what's appropriate to be spending on your fuel bills. Um, but a lot of people actually have no choice if they're in a leaky house. You know, you look at the, the NHS work we've been doing with the NHS recently, and you, if you monitor a property for three weeks pre and post external wall insulation, the temperatures and the humidity just go like this. And you can see they switch on the heating, it gets to an, a, a reasonable temperature, and they switch it off, and the heat just evaporates out the house. So a lot of people have no choice because of the house fabric. Um, so I think there is a lot about behavioural work that we need to do, but I also think we need to be quite careful where the structure is, is completely inappropriate. Exactly. And, and you know, as you identify its cross-sector, uh, trying to make sure that health and housing and social and all of that integrate and, and together work to try and support uh, the individuals create their own behaviour or change their behaviour. Uh, and if you don't get them all there, it doesn't always happen. And as I say, in, in people's expectations uh, are, are, are different depending on where they are and what street they live in. Uh, and, and, and that's a very difficult nut to crack because you know, the, the, the houses that we have and the occupancy that we have and the locations that we have uh, vary so dramatically as well, depending on if you're urban or rural or whatever you are. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's difficult. Uh, but I think what, what, you are, what you're saying and what I'm hearing is that by trying to identify most of this, it can be achieved and there can be a way forward. I'm going Sorry. to... OK, only because it's you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We'll let you in and then there's a couple of supplementaries. <coughs> I'm going to take, but and thank just you. the one answer. It, it is exactly about... So you're not targeting somebody about energy, you're targeting them about health and energy comes in or economy. And, and one household that's a few years ago, they run £11,000 a year income. Um, their energy bill was off gas was 1250 They had a benefits check and their income increased to 22000 a year. So, but they were picked up because we were doing a rural energy programme. So, it, yeah, sorry. No, please do not apologise. That's but why you're here. It is it's, about the links. Um, Thank you. We hear more, more, more yeah. from the witnesses and less from the MSPs, myself included. Um, so I've got two supplementaries in relation to this, and then we'll move on to another area. So we've got Elaine Smith and then Kenneth Gibson, and then Andy Whiteman will take you in for a new area, if that's OK, Elaine. Thank you, convener. I have a specific question for Mr Barton Maynard, please, from your submission. Um, you say in your submission that it's generally accepted that the 2015 building standards have for now reached cost optimal levels for compliance. You also talk about um, the, some of the distribution network operators being unwilling to engage with the industry. Um, and so I would like an explanation of what you mean by the cost optimal levels for compliance and also what your solution would be to distribution network operators who won't engage with the industry. And finally, three parts to this because it goes into your next paragraph on your submission. Uh, you, you talk about some local authorities choosing to add further requirements to the industry, um, often prescribing standards above and beyond what is required through the building standards. So you feel as if that 
puts barriers in place to new development. So perhaps you could expand on some of that. Ms. Sure. Oh, talk. Um, in terms of the 2015 standards and cost optimal levels and the discussions that we've had with our second members and other second architectural professionals, um, it sort of can suggest that the cost, um, in terms of cost benefit, you can add on so much more um, insulation without it sort of making a much a difference in terms of performance. So the cost difference from making interventions on a new build home now are having, I suppose, such a, a little impact on the performance of that home in terms of both sort of the fabric um, efficiency, um, primarily as the, the home becomes more airtight. So then you're adding in you know, things like air source heat pumps, which definitely have a benefit, but in terms of sort of the cost in comparison to, um, say, a sort of the gas um, central heating system, there's very little difference in terms of the sort of output. So the solutions that are sort of being brought forward, um, it's difficult to try and find the benefit for both the consumer um, in terms of carbon reduction, um, whilst the sort of the costs remain high. So that's the sort of the challenge that the industry are facing just now. As, I suppose, as technology sort of catches up with the standards, then that might be less of an issue. But it, it's sort of worthwhile have letting, sort of, I suppose, technology and supply chains sort of catch up with that um, element of um, the sort of standards. Um, for the second point um, on dis um, distribution network operators, um, we've had reports from a couple of our, um, well, a few of our members um, regarding the, the 2015 standards um, it's led um, many home builders to incorporate um, photovoltaics onto um, onto the second buildings. Um, and one of the experiences they're having is they can't get these connected back up to the network. So these um, PV systems sort of can remain on a building, um, producing energy during the day where an occupier might not be at home, um, but that energy can't go go anywhere. Um, one of the reasons for this, um, from some of the engagement we've had with um, the DNOs, was that the existing sort of network, electricity network around um, around the development, wasn't capable of absorbing that electricity back into the network. So, could sure. that not have been something that was cleared before? Um, from our members have been struck that, that I think that's the point of not being able to sort of engage with the electricity providers on that um, prior to certain planning. Um, and then, uh, uh, as I say, we, we've tried to sort of engage um, with, uh, I suppose, bringing um, to the two MDA, um, electricity DNOs um, to discussions, and we've had quite, quite a lot of difficulty in doing so. But um, as I say, the feedback we've had from members has been that it's been difficult um, to sort of do. Um, I suppose on the final oh, sorry, point. Could ask again, could oh, you know, sure. is, is there some specific places that you could tell us? Is, is this specific to a certain area of Scotland, or um, is it across the areas? Um, I believe I understand it's been regional, but I, I can go back to our sort of members and pick up um, a sort of regional breakdown of that. If that would be helpful. No, on that. No. Okay. Um, yes. Please. Briefly on um, the information we have on that, that. A year ago, it was really easy to connect, or not easy, but there was space in the grid across Scotland. Um, and as the number of wind farms have increased and um, the photovoltaic systems have increased, with photovoltaics, you need to feed it into the grid, so you need to be able to feed in um, to that route. But as the, um, the network operators are saying that they're all now getting full, these grid systems, they are actually very reluctant to let you feed in electricity into the grid. So that's where the problem comes from. Um, I'm not quite sure on, on the new build, but, but that's certainly on existing homes, people are finding it more difficult as well. Okay, um, Fabrice, did you want to add to that? Just to expand on the, the building regulations and the new, new build, um, to build on Michael's point, in terms of, uh, yeah, there's been progress on efficiency and new homes are very efficient. And yet we're still installing them with gas boilers and technology that we know from the climate change plan uh, we need to be phasing out very rapidly. Um, I think if house builders are going down the solar PV route, it's probably because they're looking for a sort of lowest cost way to, to meet their obligations. And perhaps something we need to look at is the fact that we'd rather they were spending their money on renewable heat 
in the, these new buildings because that would provide a market for these new technologies. So France and Germany install thousands of heat pumps a year and a big reason for that big market is the fact that they have new build standards that require that of new buildings. So I think it kind of flagged a, a weakness of the current um, proposals or the current uh, regulations. And I think what would be useful in terms of uh, seeing the trajectory is for the climate change plan to tell us exactly what it is, what the assumed emissions reduction path for building standards is um, over the 5, 10, 15 next years. That information will be within the Scottish Government's modelling that underpin the plan, but yet it isn't shared with us. So when Sullivan 3 begins its review, um, it would be useful for them to sit down and say, well, the climate change plan said, says that on efficiency and renewable heat, we expect buildings to be doing X, Y and Z, which at the moment we, we are completely in the dark as to what that assumption is. That's, that, that, that's been very helpful. I just, as you're saying these things, I'm thinking about the 32 local authorities who are, have got their strategic housing plans out there in relation to what their spatial plan is going to be for sustainable communities. And one of the things we might want to check as a committee to see it actually joins up with each other, so, so, some of that stuff. Um, Mr Barton Maynard, do you want to add anything to that before I move to Mr Gibson? Um, certainly, um, I suppose on that sort of point on sort of energy standards, um, you know, it's worth sort of noting that um, when the latest energy standards were um, sort of calculated, calculated, you're right in terms of promoting um, certain solutions like PV and um, electricity generating technologies. It was very much part of the, um, the sort of policy and the development of the standards and the way that the SALP calculations sort of worked. Um, so that has been one of the sort of leading drivers away from that fabric first approach that had, had been uh, implemented before. <coughs> Thank you. And I think our Deputy Convener uh, highlighted a very important line of questioning that might otherwise have went missed. So thank you for that, Mr Gibson. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, in, in the bullet point four of the existing Homes Alliance uh, submission, it says, and I quote, rural off-gas grid and electrically heated properties should get priority with upgrades to efficient, affordable and low carbon heat by 2025. And in paragraph four of Homes for Scotland's submission, it says that by 2050, only 31% of housing stock will have been constructed to 2010 building standards or higher, meaning that around 70% will have to have some form of retrofitted energy efficiency measure over the next 33 years. But the issue here, which I want to raise, is under the Scotland's Energy Efficiency Programme section of the SPICE report, which says, and I quote, uh, some of the drawbacks to actually delivery of this are, and I quote, lack of interest in building owners in making energy efficiency improvements and mistrust in the promotion and installation of energy efficiency measures and examples of poor workmanship and a need to provide advice and information to change occupant behaviours. Now, Mr... Uh, Mr Levesque, in, in your response to Mr uh, Stewart's questions, you talked about how we should influence behaviour, talking about encouragement, incentives, you know, regulation. But how do you overcome that suspicion and that barrier among the public? Because what we're talking about is delivery of policy, regulation, etc., etc. But there clearly seems, according to Spice anyway, a real kind of bottleneck here that we have to overcome. So how can we actually address that? And I would like, obviously, um, others to, to comment on that issue as well. OK, thank you, Mr Gibson. Mr Levesque? So on the confidence and uh, instilling that confidence in consumers, I think the Scottish approach works really well in that we have area-based schemes. Um, so they're delivered by local authorities or partnerships um, with local authorities, and that's been proven to work really well because uh, the UK government schemes, so, for example, the Eco Energy Company obligation, that's delivered by uh, the big, big six energy suppliers. And um, like banks, those companies aren't very popular, and people are quite suspicious of a company coming along and offering you insulation. And the way that scheme's been delivered in terms of going for bulk volume has led to uh, quite mercenary companies uh, targeting the lowest cost houses. Um, the Scottish approach, which um, SEEP should build on, is this area-based um, uh, method. It has a couple of advantages, as I've said. The local authorities um, are kind of the, the figurehead, which people have far more trust in. Um, I think also in terms of creating confidence in the actual product and what we're offering, the fact that people see these improvements taking place, so a whole street will be done, improved for its external wall insulation, that has been shown to instill interest and confidence amongst consumers. And what we have at the moment is um, very few people making uh, these kinds of improvements. If we have the transformational policies that we've been promised by the Scottish Government, 
um, an upscaling of the, the energy efficiency programme, uh, greater uh, activity, that should pull through more demand from consumers as uh, the market grows. And as that market grows, the companies, the already very good companies that we have in Scotland, uh, who are delivering good quality installations, can expand. And there are good links with um, the skills, skills academies in Scotland trying to train up people. And what we have at the moment is a kind of chicken or egg situation where we don't have much clarity beyond the next few years in, saying that in terms of the scale of the market um, that will be delivered. We know what the ambition is, which is very big. But until there's more certainty, how do we, you know, we can't really expect those small supply chain companies to, to stop feeding hand to mouth and to invest in, in, in better skills. Okay, do you want to add to that? Hey, Liz, thank you. That'd be helpful. Hey, um, I would say that as the um, contracts with local authorities have, that we're now on the fourth year of the area based schemes. Um, and they've been a mixture of internal and external wall insulation, but more recently they've been predominantly external wall insulation, or, and internal, sorry, and both of those are actually much more visible. Previous schemes used to be cavity wall and loft insulation. Um, now those are nothing like as visible. Um, and since they've become more visible with external wall insulation, we are um, crushed in the rush to have the work done it's a completely different um, uh, customer behaviour. Um, we don't advertise it much because so many people are really, really desperate to have the work done to their properties. Um, and as they've become more difficult construction projects, so all the people managing the schemes have had to get much smarter about how we police and monitor that work. So actually, the complexity has probably had a lot of benefits that actually the quality is now very heavily controlled at a local level. Um, and it was before, but again, it wasn't as visible. So I think the quality has really gone up a great deal as the schemes have become bigger and um, more complex, because it is complex external wall insulation. Um, so I think that, that's that been a huge benefit. Um, and historically, there have been problems. but. I, Mr. Yeah. Stewart, and just, just before you answer, Mr. Stewart, I know this was an area that Andy Whiteman was keen to develop further as well, so I'm just giving you a, 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 a heads up, Mr. Whiteman, that we'll take you in shortly, uh, Mr. Stewart. Briefly to add to what's been said, I, I think to gain the benefits and, and to achieve um, the targets we want to, something we've not really discussed today that's incredibly important is there needs to be appropriate energy advice and guidance. Um, Housing associations who've installed um, renewable heating have found that it's incredibly important to provide face-to-face -face support, possibly to do that more than once, to provide plain um, information that's not technical. Otherwise, um, you run the risk of making improvements, making investments, but not actually um, getting the desired outcomes that, that you would expect because you've not thought enough about the, the people side. Okay, thank you for that. Mr Gibson, are you... Yeah. And I just have some concerns, though, that, uh, that you know, that the owner-occupied sector is lagging behind. And one of the things that uh, I find confusing uh, all, uh, when uh, constituents contact me about this particular issue is that the, the grant landscape seems to change frequently, almost month to month, who's eligible, what they're eligible for, etc. And it, you always have to refer them on because it changes so frequently, it's very difficult to keep up. Uh, and, and in fact, Spice have also said grant application deadlines are challenging, do not often align with each other. So how do we try and have a wee bit more stability in that so that we actually you know, don't have to check almost on a daily basis what, how much is available, who qualifies, what it's for, because that seems to uh, put a lot of people off, um, and it certainly undermines my confidence in being able to provide, um, you know, advice to constituents. Mr. Short. So I think that's very true, and we've had heard that experience both from owners and also from social landlords who have looked to apply to schemes. Um, I think the devolution of some control over the energy company obligation and its successors, together with the, the fact that the Scottish Government are developing an energy policy, hopefully provides an opportunity for a longer term planning and consistency. And I think that 
that would be absolutely key in actually gaining the most benefit. And, and while I know you're asking specifically about owners, um, we carried out a piece of research um, questioning associations on their experience of energy efficiency funding about a year ago. And one of the key messages was not so much about the level of funding that's available, that's important, but it's knowing long term it'll be available and what it'll be for, because that would allow them to plan. It would allow their uh, maintenance programmes to tie in with grant funding. And so I, I think um, clarity on the length of period funding would be available, who it's for and what it's for would be hugely helpful. We'll seamlessly into Mr Whiteman's uh, ne next question. Thank you, Mr Gibson, for that. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, yeah, I just want to get a brief um, perspective from you on what you think the priorities should be in the new Scottish Energy Efficiency Programme. There's a consultation out on at the moment, obviously, um, but a lot of reliance is being placed on that to deliver the energy efficiency targets. And so, I mean, Fabrice has already said that we're lagging behind a little bit on regulation, for example. Um, so what would you be your, your key priorities to ensure are in this plan to deliver um, the climate change targets and also the energy efficiency targets. Okay, Fabrice, you were mentioned in, in, in the question. Perhaps we'll take you first, if that's all right. So the three priorities as we see them for uh, the, the energy efficiency programme, but also getting information into the climate change plan, um, is, as I said before, setting a target for the scheme. Um, so the policy outcome one kind of talks about um, a vague emissions reduction by 2032. It's um, not exactly a headline target you'd want to shout from the rooftops about. So setting a, a clear target based on EPCs or an equivalent um, is a big priority. I think that would move us forward in that it would then help secure the commitments to regulation and funding from the Scottish Government. Because as we've seen in the past, uh, those, we have those commitments there, but those are key political decisions that need to be made. So I think a target would help pull those through. Um, and as you said, Andy, the uh, second part is regulation. So putting some firm dates in terms of when exactly is the private rented sector regulation expected to start delivering? Is that what doubles uh, installation rates from 2018? Um, and in terms of the owner-occupied sector, we also have to have clarity in terms of when, when will that be consulted on and when will those regulations come into force? We're, we're lo rapidly losing time on this because these regulations work if you set them several years in advance. Um, ideally, you don't want to have to force people into compliance. If you set them far away enough, they drive a market change by themselves. And we're seeing that with the, the rented regulations in England and Wales. So yet more lost time means we're pushing these regulations another four or five years down the line, which makes delivery of what's in the plan even less credible than, than it is at present. And the last uh, third point is just on funding. Uh, let's not forget that the the Scottish Government budget has essentially just locked us in to a reduced funding commitment for the next, uh, until the end of the Parliament. Um, so to deliver in terms of fuel poverty, we'll need to increase uh, Scottish Government funding and also look at providing incentives for the other occupied sectors. But can, can I just, I know it's your question, Mr. Whiteman, can I just, just push slightly, for Fabrice, because like, th th there's a funding framework put that to one side for the moment, but the question is kind of, if I've got caps it right, Mr Whiteman, we've got all these policies, we've got these targets, what should the delivery programme on the ground actually look like? Is there a consultation on that just now? So we'll maybe come back to you on that. I don't know if anyone else wants to uh, come in in relation to this question. Mr Stewart, do you want to? Um, really, um, again, from members' experience, uh, for us, if you are going to prioritise delivery, um, it should be on the hard to treat, um, you know, solid wall insulation, uh, mixed tenure tenements are a big problem, but very particularly on off gas areas where people have higher heating costs and also often have longer heating seasons. Anyone else? I'm going to come back to you, Fabrice, saying what you would like to be in the programme. I will come back to you. Liz, do you want to add anything? I'm very reluctant to say it, but sometimes if you have other um, key performance indicators, then it drives other um, behaviours in the delivery end. Um, and one of the things that, from a delivery point of view for customers, we try and make quite sure that we're clear about all the benefits 
including the economic benefits, the health benefits. So there might be, and I need to be very careful what I say here, um, that actually on the energy efficiency programs, you could be looking at more of the other additional benefits. Now that is coming with the economic, the local economic benefits, but there are an awful lot of other things that has an impact on people's lives when their community improves, so there's the social capital that is involved, the areas look better, they feel better, they invest more in their own communities. And that's very clear on the ground, and we've got a lot of um, qualitative evidence from people that, that they say that in, in relation to energy efficiency programmes and the additional money that's spent in the local community. But it's actually very hard to capture that as an energy efficiency program. But yet the benefits are just huge. So I'm not, I don't have a, I don't have the knowledge of how you would capture it. But I think that's what on the ground we try to link all these and have an integrated approach. And the more integrated it's happening in terms of reporting and across government, the better it is and the easier it becomes at the ground level. No, that that is very helpful in relation to the new build sector. Is there anything you want to add in relation, Mr. Barty Maynard? Um, no, I suppose the only thing from the new build sector is in terms of sort of regulation, um, in terms of um, new build standards. The only thing we would sort of ask is just to make sure that we're, when we're looking at new energy standards, that we're looking at mainstream technologies um, that are there, but also sort of you know, looking to create a regulatory environment that gives confidence to investors, um, to the industry and to supply chains, to be able to sort of deliver um, you know, nice sort of time frames in which people can react. Um, the, I suppose the other point, just to sort of quickly make, is um, given the sort of work that Homes of Scotland are doing on the sort of private rented sector, um, in particular sort of build to rent, that you know, we, we would also sort of welcome um, sort of bringing forward the um, review of energy standards for the private rented sector as well. We think that there's an opportunity to, um, I suppose, for um, more, more and more organisations to sort of get involved in the bringing forward new build private rented housing to the sector as well, which can only go to improving the housing stock. Okay, thank you. Yes, that's, yeah. Detail. Um, the recent shelter report um, said that every 41 pence that is spent on energy efficiency saves the NHS a pound. Um, so that, that's on the, this recent one that's been produced. So there is clear evidence that spending on energy efficiency has other impacts. Um, I don't have the, the rest of the detail, but it's, it's quite an impressive figure. Um, and we need to keep those sort of um, other things in mind. I think that's a point well made. Uh, Fabrice, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to put as much on the public record as possible today, because we'll use the information we get when we when we produce our report. So, in relation to programmes as they go forward, is there anything you want to add? Uh, just to elaborate on the, on the question in terms of the structure of the energy efficiency programme. So, we, we've called for an area expansion of area-based schemes, so the work that Liz is doing, combined with a national fuel poverty programme, which we already have, but it's too, too small in scale. Um, in terms of the structure um, and how we deliver it, and picking up on your points in terms of making this a holistic plan. So it needs to be ideally through local partnerships of local authorities, um, social and healthcare providers, um, as well as housing and regeneration. So all those different strands of work need to be brought together. Um, we also think it needs to have across a departmental ministerial group within the Scottish Government, because this is such a, a key policy across different portfolios. So that kind of um, oversight and prominence would, is needed to drive this forward to make sure it kind of ticks all the boxes in terms of the things it, it could deliver. That's helpful. Can I just say for the benefit of members and, and, and witnesses, uh, we have overrun our time, but I don't want to curtail discussion in relation to this important area. So we'll maybe run for another 20 minutes or so, and members, we can just discipline ourselves when we look at things in, in, in private, OK? So I just wanted to, 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 to make you aware of that. Do you want to follow up on some of that, Mr Whiteman, or move us on? Um, well, I have a further question on, 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 on um, decarbonisation, but there's a couple of supplementaries on that. Um, Homes for Scotland, in paragraph six, you, you provide some, um, you say, some data around the energy savings. Would you be in a position to provide us with the full data that you referenced there? Um, I'll to confirm just with our members that we're allowed to share that um, they're sort of going to be good at the records, but um, if we can break it down, um, I can potentially that, share that. that. That would be helpful. And the other little supplementary panel members may not be able to assist on this, I don't know, we'll do our own inquiries, but 
going back to the question that Ruth McGuire asked about the 6% reduction in heat demand by 2032, we understand that that is a 6% reduction on the projected heat demand in 2032. We're not clear what the projected heat demand is in 2032 and how it's been calculated, um, but you might care to reflect on that, perhaps not now, but in, 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 in evidence you um, give to the committee, because it seems to me anyway that's not a very ambitious target for heat demand if we're investing all this money and effort into energy efficiency. OK, I'm, I'm not sure if there was a question in that or if it was maybe asking you to come reflect on it and contact the committee again. Yeah, do you want to explore some further, Mr Whitman? Um, yes, maybe, I've maybe got... Maybe it's the policy area too, it's up to yourself or your hands. Um, OK, so the, the, the other question relates to policy outcome too, and that's where Fabrice has already said we've got quite substantial, it's quite significant um, challenging uh, goals of decarbonisation by 2032. Do you think these low carbon heat technologies that are being discussed, I understand that they revolve around putting hydrogen into the gas grid, etc., are realistic in that time scale? Oh, in fact, yes, well, you, you, you're self-policing yourselves here. Witnesses, <laughs> Mr Stewart will take you first. Um, I'm not an expert on technology, so that, that's a little difficult to say. But what I would say is um, investing in home energy efficiency, reducing demand, um, it's got a strong track record. We know that it works. Um, we know that it's cost effective. It, it would seem to me that the plan, particularly from 2025 to 2032, concentrates a great deal on technology and renewables, eh, and I suspect there may be a risk in that, whereas we know really increasing home energy efficiency can work. We can look to other um, European countries, such as Denmark, who also have quite an old housing stock, but have a uh, much higher energy efficiency. So we know that that's um, a solution that, that can work. OK, thank you. Fabrice, do you want to add to some of that? Yeah, on the on the sort of credibility of the heat proposals, um, I think in the near term, the focus on off-gas grid homes and heat networks in urban centres, um, there is actually quite a large potential there. Maybe it could get you up to say 30% uh, renewable heat. Um, so that's that's definitely credible. It should be made clear in the climate change plan that that is what they're intending to do. Um, in terms of the longer term gas grid, hydrogen, you know, what, what's happening there? I think you're right to pick up on the credibility of that. The pathway in the Scottish Government plan is far quicker than the, the one that's recommended by the Committee on Climate Change. Uh, so I'd be very interested to know uh, why the over-reliance almost on renewable heat in buildings is how that's come about. Um, and the, the second, second part of that is to say that we're kind of easing off, it looks like we're easing off on fabric uh, energy efficiency and then going quicker in later years. So it's kind of a backloading of effort. Um, so you're absolutely right to pick up on it. It's questionable in terms of in the technology that will do it, um, but also in terms of the other things that have moved to, uh, to give it space. And in my view, it's energy efficiency which has slowed down um, at the expense of this indeterminate policy for, for the gas grid. And, and just to clarify on, on hydrogen and, and gas uh, in, the, in the gas grid, I think the, the best plan to tackle heat is to kind of come at it from the heat pump side and the heat networks. So... We can make inroads either side of the gas network, and then at some future point, yes, we will have to make a big decision on that. Uh, the options aren't quite clear. It used to be that we'd have hybrid electric heat pumps. So essentially, have heat pumps in homes and then a small gas boiler to top up for the really cold periods so that all our combined electricity demands don't uh, create too much of a burden on the electricity system. Um, that's slightly changed in recent years, and there's this new focus on hydrogen as a possible way of of decarbonising buildings. Uh, people like it because it sounds like business as usual. Let's just put hydrogen into the gas grid. But we need to be clear about what we're talking about. Uh, the hydrogen has to be produced. So it needs to come from either biomethane, gas or coal. So we'll need to have a feedstock to produce the hydrogen. And in the quantities that we're talking about for buildings, it would probably have to be gas or coal. We then need to build CCS, so carbon capture and storage, to take the CO2 from making the hydrogen and store it underneath the North Sea. So that's a big infrastructure requirement right there. So CCS equipment on the outside of cities and then uh, networks of pipes taking the gas um, to, to the coast. Um, and obviously locking ourselves into more fossil fuel production 
raises all sorts of questions. At the moment, we kind of give a blank check to the fossil fuel companies, and there's no requirement on them to develop CCS or invest in it. So the credibility of CCS as a technology that will actually come along is dubious, given that we had two uh, UK government-funded schemes to develop the technology, and both have been scrapped, and we're nowhere near it in this country of actually building our first plant. Um, so just to give you a bit of a, a, bit of a bigger picture on, on hydrogen. Okay, any other witnesses want to come in and add anything to the, the new technologies? Uh, Andy Whiteman, do you want to? Okay, no. uh, Graham Simpson. Thanks, uh, thanks convener. Um, my, my question is, uh, well, I've got two questions for Mr. Barton Maynard, uh, but just, just as a point of information for Fabrice Levesque, um, there is a, a sort of hydrogen, hydrogen scheme going on there in Leeds at the moment, um, so it may, may well be worth looking at. Um, so, Mr. Barton Maynard, um, in your evidence to us, which is a public document uh, now in paragraph 16, um, you talk about uh, making great strides um, um, and then you go on to say it's disappointing to read and hear statements made by some MSPs failing to recognise the positive aspect of new build housing. Um, who do you mean by that? Um, I wouldn't want to be specific on names. Um, I think it's mainly been from our sort of engagement in the past um, and from sort of reading some of the statements that have been made um, in Parliament, the, the, it tends to lead to a perception that new build homes aren't um, as energy efficient uh, as, as they are. Um, and I think this is a, sort of a theme that's sort of been picked up by um, a number of my colleagues um, in support of writing um, this um, evidence. I think the the thing about new build um, homes is that they offer considerable benefits to the end user, um, whether that, whatever the tenure um, that, that is. Um, and quite often, um, in, ter in, in terms of um, discussing about the, the kind of private sector, um, it gets muddled, um, I believe, um, whether we're talking about PRS as, as being sort of poor quality stock. We, forget about um, things like sort of build to rent, where we're talking about brand new, really energy efficient housing sort of coming forward. And when we talk about new builds, um, we rarely sort of note the um, success um, successes that have been there in reducing energy bills and the energy efficiency that's going to come through the step change in standards. I'll stop you there. Um, you, you've made a statement in this public document now um, saying that some MSPs have uh, basically slagged off um, new, new build homes. Um, surely you're entitled to know who you mean. Well, well it's for Mr. Barton Maynard to answer the question as he decides to answer the question, but I think you've been pretty clear that you're keen to know specifically what he's referring to in a pub public document. Mr. Indeed. Barton Maynard, do you want to respond to that? Um, I have no further comments to make on that question. Okay. Um, so, we look at these um, great strides then um, that, that have been made. The uh, current um, building standards regulations um, go uh, date from 2015. Uh, I understand that just before they came uh, into effect, there was a huge rush of applications to building standards departments uh, in councils across Scotland. Tens of thousands of applications were made uh, to get in ahead of those regulations. Uh, so many, in fact, that the Scottish Government had to give councils uh, an 18-month grace period to deal with them. Um, and so that we have uh, currently um, people with um, warrants under the old regulations sitting there not having uh, laid a brick. So how, houses can now be built that are not built to these 2015 building standards. Would you agree with that? Um, it's something that um, we are uh, aware of. Um, we understand a few home builders um, have um, put applications in before the 2015 standards. I think that part of that's an impact from the, the very rapid changes and um, step changes in standards that have happened. Um, 
2010 came in after three years um, um, from the 27, um, 2007 um, standards. Then we had 2010, we had the review in 2012. Um, the, Sullivan, the second Sullivan report um, delayed that to 2015. But when we're talking about major step changes in standards, um, yes, I um, understand home builders did um, put in applications at that point. But we need to sort of make sure that the system in future allows um, greater vision, greater knowledge of what's going to be happening in the future, um, a sort of longer period in which building standards apply would be extremely helpful in avoiding um, the sort of, I suppose, that type of behaviour of um, sort of loading a system up at the beginning. Um, just to sort of note that 2010 standards still remain very highly energy efficient as well. Um, we're still talking about uh, an EPC um, energy efficiency rating of a B um, and um, energy um, bills estimated in the region of around £50 per month. Um, that's as much as I probably answer on that one. Okay, a any further supplementaries on that, Mr Simpson? Confirmed uh, the information I had. Okay. Um, Thank you. Uh, Mr Whiteman, you were pursuing a line of questioning. Uh, before I take our Deputy Commander in for a further line of questioning, would you like to come back in? No, thanks. Okay. Elaine Smith. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Just to explore a little bit further um, the policy outcome to, with regard to low carbon heat technologies and um, domestic buildings. Uh, we have actually discussed some of it throughout the session this morning. So perhaps if you could maybe, and it's up to convener whether these are final comments or not, but maybe you, um, if you'd all just like to make further comment on that with regard to, um, is some of the progress on outcome two is expected to take place after 2025. So how could the Scottish Government actually make further progress on this outcome before that date? We've also talked about consumer behaviour being influenced. We've specifically talked about heat pumps and where they're appropriate and where they're not appropriate. So maybe some further comment on um, consumer behaviour and influencing it uh, with regard to the installation of low carbon heat technologies. And finally from me, the fact that the low carbon um, heat technologies are often more expensive to run, then how effectively does the, the CCP address the issue of um, fuel poverty. So if you've captured all that, I can confirm these might, might very well be your final comments, given that, that time is upon us, unless, of course, our Deputy Convener wants to follow up with a supplementary, which I'm in, I'm in her hands in relation to. So these could be your final comments. So anything else you wish to throw in, as well as answering the Deputy Convener's question, would be helpful. Uh, Liz, can we take you first? <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> working okay. on a few bits. That's can okay. I do a quick, I'll do a quick one? on a few bits, let's go to Mr Stewart first. Okay. That's not a problem. Right. Yeah, um, I really um, agree with some of the points I think that you're making in your question. Um, I think there needs to be more focus on home energy efficiency first. Um, I, I know I've said that already, but I think that's absolutely key, particularly if we're looking at um, moving to renewable technologies where people have previously had gas central heating. Uh, I would say that we should look to increase deployment of uh, renewable technology now and not wait until 2025, but similar to what others have said, I think that should be targeted on off-gas areas where we know actually that you're providing a cheaper and more energy efficient form of heating. So in short, really, I would say big emphasis on home energy efficiency before renewable technologies are heated or fitted and prioritise off-gas grid buildings um, when you first deploy them. So, I guess to sum up, in terms of the, the second policy outcome on renewable heat, I think the I think you're absolutely right in terms of asking, you know, is it credible and what, what more could be added? I think that one of the first most important questions is what exactly drives the acceleration in renewable heat from now to 2020, given there isn't a new policy in here. Um, we'd love to know what that policy is and to suggest a couple, I think uh, building standards, um, as I said, we're not building New buildings go in with gas boilers, they could go in with heat pumps instead, or they could drive heat networks more strongly. Um, so that's one proposal that should be in here. Um, in terms of the, the behaviour change, uh, especially on low carbon heat, I think the SEEK programme contains all the elements that we've discussed, so the information, um, the area-based schemes helping to, to disseminate that, 
um, in terms of the regulation as well. So I think the SEAT programme has all the, the components. It needs to be funded and um, the development of the programme needs to be brought forward more swiftly. It's been very slow and the consultation we currently have doesn't really give us anything new that we didn't already have. Um, and the final point in terms of low carbon heat and fuel poverty, um, I think you need to remember that installing heat networks uh, often reduces heating costs and in fact lots of social housing providers um, have installed heat networks because it does um, provide a fuel poverty benefit. Uh, in terms of heat pumps off the gas grid in a very well insulated home and echoing what's been said before, we need to make sure that those homes are efficient first. Installing a heat pump then lowers your um, heating cost because they're much more efficient. So I think actually there as well, uh, there's less of a risk. Where there is an issue is that we don't really have a financing um, mechanism for everybody to have low carbon heat. So the renewable heat incentive from the UK government provides you with a kind of a feed-in tariff if you have the upfront capital to invest, um, but for fuel poor households, there's nothing there. So either we have to pay for those measures or provide a, a discount for them. Um, and I'll, I think I'll leave it there. OK, that's, that, 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 that's helpful, Mr Barton Maynard. I'm just probably sort of going to agree with some of the kind of sentiment and comments that were going to be made um, by my colleagues to my left. Um, yeah, I suppose the only sort of real point I was going to like to make um, was really sort of really just to sort of confirm that we're going to need a more aligned approach to the sort of regulation policy that's going to come through. Just making sure that all the sort of dots connect and that we're all working together in order to in, in, in collaboration and in cooperation in order to sort of achieve the aspirations of the RPP. OK, thank you very much. And Liz Marcus. Um, really, there are so many variables in this, and it's, it's really so important to get everybody working together. We all understand it from our own individual basis, but it's, it's making sure that works across government and in the delivery. Um, I think one thing that we haven't touched on, we've talked about um, the provision of energy efficiency advice, but also the home visiting service is pretty key to that for vulnerable households. There is a real need um, to deliver specific services. The fact that, it, that a lot of the funding is run out through local authorities is essential because it ensures that there is delivery across Scotland. Um, and most of the lo local authorities are very knowledgeable about their own geographical area. Um, the heat, heat networks are a brilliant idea and we need to really be putting those in correctly um, about 15 years ago, we were trying to do heat networks locally in Esher, and everybody said, oh, no, you know, we want to be in charge of our own heat. But actually, things have moved on hugely, and a lot of developments, but at that point, the public perception was too closely related to um, uh, different government environments, um, not operating in the UK, um, but they associated it more with um, Poland or Czech Republic and people weren't happy but now with a lot of the work in Aberdeen and the, the heat work heat networks are becoming much more acceptable um, I think the other really important thing is to link all the developments and the regulation to the commercial buildings and to education environments so that in people's work and in their home they hear about energy it needs to be something that we all understand so much more about and people are very receptive in a, um, a work environment if it affects their home. So rolling out education programmes, training in education, to explain to everybody how um, energy affects them. Um, and um, we really need the long-term targets, but achieve as much as we can as quickly as possible. Very, very helpful. I think Elaine Smith just wants to add something <coughs> briefly. I just briefly, I, I, we haven't had an awful lot of discussion this morning about solid stone properties and the difficulties with them and tenements. So I think rather than ask questions, I think we just need to, to note that that is an issue and also perhaps consider what's been done to encourage um, the creation of technologies that might help with those kind of problems. So that would be all, Convener. OK, thank you very much, Elaine. Um, can I thank all our witnesses for coming along to aid us in our scrutiny of the Scottish Government's Draft Climate Change Plan, RPP3, um, we've taken considerably longer than we'd scheduled for this, but I think that's important because we have to report on this and we want to get it right. So can I thank all the witnesses for the information provided to help us do that? And can I suspend briefly at this point? Thank you.
back and when I move to agenda item three, which is subordinate legislation, the committee will consider two negative instruments as listed on the agenda, SSIs 2016 forward slash 432 and 2016 forward slash 433. These instruments are laid under the negative procedure, which means that the provisions will come into force unless the parliament votes on a motion to annul the instruments. I can confirm that no motions to annul have been laid. Can I invite members question whether they have any comments to make on the instruments before us? Yes, Mr Whiteman. Uh, I just want to say I particularly welcome the um, licensing of the uh, caravan sites. I think this has been something that folk have wanted for a long time and it's great to see secondary legislation coming through that improves the lives of people who live on mobile home sites. Uh, can I thank Mr Whiteman for putting that on the record? Because sometimes anyone watching at home will just hear us utter numbers and, and wonder what on earth we're talking about. So that's helpful that you've drawn attention to what the statute instrument is actually in relation to. But can I therefore invite uh, the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments? Are we agreed? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. And we now move into private session as previously agreed. Thank you.